thanks very much, Sharon, for um, chatting with me today in this sort of informal way, um, both as scholars in um, what is broadly sort of called higher education studies, but um, I really appreciate that you're chatting um, with me. We obviously, we met before um, in person two years ago now, if you can believe that the time has passed <laughs> so much. <laughs> Um, and since then, there have been a whole lot of really gorgeous publications that have come out that I've picked up from you, um, including about um, sustainability and all sorts of things. But for today, what I wanted to ask you about was specifically um, internationalization, which is sort of an area you've been um, writing about and also researching. Um, so I thought, if possible, we could start with a question around that. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about yourself first. There will be a little bio under this recording um, when we embed it, but you're very welcome to introduce yourself if, you, if you'd like to before we move on to chatting. Sure. You know, I'm so embarrassed because um, one of the things that Indigenous communities in Canada have requested that um, we do before speaking even virtually um, is acknowledging the territory on which we are. And I have just moved, and I believe I'm on Stolo territory, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, that was definitely a, a misstep on my part. Um, but I think I say that not only because I, I try to acknowledge it in every time I speak, but for a couple other reasons in relation to critical internationalization studies, which is um, that you know, number one, we, in the international mode, we sometimes do forget the responsibilities to the local. And so some of my work more recently has been trying to bridge these questions of what is the interface between internationalization and indigenization in a place like Canada or the US. Um, but also because in general, in this um, virtual mode that we're in, we kind of forget also our accountabilities to different communities, both near and far. But if we think about not only the indigenous lands that I'm on, um, but also the fact that the minerals that make up the computer that we're talking to each other from are also mined in um, terrible conditions and probably ecologically unsustainable ones as well. So we can already start to see that, you know, there's nothing neutral about any of our conversations about, you know, higher education or, or internationalization. And so um, I'm just using that sort of introductory moment to sort of flag the, the direction that my work goes in. Um, but yeah, I'm a, a scholar here uh, currently in what is currently known as Canada. I'm originally from uh, the US. I'm a settler, white settler in both places. And um, a lot of my work is trying to ask uh, how we learn to live together differently after um, these 500 plus years of living together in dissonance. Dissonance is really a, a euphemistic word for, for genocide. Um, but uh, the, the crises that we're facing, I think, really demand all of us to think really differently about how we arrived here, where we're going, and if there's a different direction we could be moving. So I think I'll leave it there for my intro. <laughs> It's a great intro, though, because um, you've managed to sort of stir the pot. Um, <laughs> and and in the stirring, so much of the stuff, right, the, the, the stuff that's actually really important um, to what you're what you're trying to study has come to, to the surface. Right. Um, so I, I'm going to be asking what seem like quite simple questions, um, but I really welcome you doing exactly what you just did. Um, okay. And um, and so one of the a lot of the people who are listening to this may be people who who are interested in higher education studies, which you know in various parts of the world is developed in such different ways and understood in such different ways. But certainly um, the the students and the collaborators that I work with, who will probably be more of the people who are listening to this, um, are interested with some of the problematics around higher education and also trying to use their scholarship um, and if not their scholarship then their and then their practice um, with grappling with those problematics um, so right at the end of your intro you spoke about um, just the crises that we're in mm -hmm. and I guess 
um, I guess a way to start is um, you could we could start in two days, two ways. I guess <laughs> I'm thinking one question that I'm thinking is why out of all the things that you could be studying and critiquing and questioning in terms of higher education, have you to have you focused on internationalization? Mm -hmm. And the other one is, um, I guess, how do you feel that um, scholarship or the study of of the 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 crises or the more than I mean the crises, the conditions that we're in in higher education? How do you how do you think? It could contribute um, to discussions, debates, or hopefully addressing some of the issues. So, when you the, la the latter question, when you say, "How could the scholarship and study of higher education, or of the conditions that we're facing in higher education?" Do you mean um, how can we address the issues in the institution, or how can higher education as address the wider issues, or both? <laughs> No, so I guess I'm saying because a lot of people will think, why, why should, why would, what difference would scholarship make? Uh -huh, so it's okay. not necessarily how higher education does it, but yeah. how does the study of it or the critiquing of it, or how might that contribute, or is that a failed mm -hmm. project in itself, in a way, you know? Um, yeah. What is the value <laughs> in it? Well, I have to admit, sometimes I ask myself that question. And part of it's because I feel that we are at not just higher education studies, but like much of the university is really out of touch with reality in a way. And I've been thinking about part of it might have to do with um, generational questions, which is that if we, th and it's not only that, but if we think about who is making up our institutions, especially the leadership of our institutions and as higher education faculty have become more um, casualized, there are less and less sort of of the younger generations coming in and taking positions of leadership or being trained for that. So I do feel there's a bit of a, apart from clearly being a, a white dominated and in many cases male dominated institution, there's sort of a gerontocracy of higher education. And I, and I do feel that people are operating in um, outdated or largely outdated paradigms of, of, um, of how we conceptualize problems and how we address them. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think it's, it's a problem for, um, for the institution most of all, <laughs> because I think we're in danger of becoming irrelevant. We already see, thanks to technology and other things, that um, there is this sort of proliferation of knowledge production outside of the university. We no longer have the sort of claim to hegemonic authority on knowledge, which in many ways is a good thing, not necessarily how it's happening, um, but there's still this idea, I think in many scholars in many fields, that we are, um, by the scholarship we write and the normative values we put forward in those articles, we're going to prescribe what should happen as if we could dictate any kind of common sense, but these days there's no such thing. There's a million little echo chambers. And so trying to kind of enforce that consensus is basically impossible, not to mention colonial, which I don't, you don't even have to get to. You just say it's not possible anymore. And yet we're still operating as if that's the case. We also, of course, largely haven't dealt with the colonial legacies that have made up our institutions, which again, it has an effect not only on the continuation of that colonial violence and our complicity in it, but also in terms of understanding the root of the problems we face. So for me, if I think about the current problems of higher education or pretty much any institution or system, it all goes back to um, the violence and unsustainability that are at the root of the foundations of our institutions and are sort of eating away. Um, they've kind of sucked up all the resources outside of them and now they're sort of eating themselves <laughs> and we don't see that we see the problem as some external factor we don't see that we've basically done this to ourselves in many ways uh, because it's much easier to see the problem is coming from somewhere else and it's too hard to face the possibility that what we have may not be sustainable we might have not have the continuity that we often assume or at least fantasize that we will have so i think 
if we can't um, address these colonial legacies and their enduring impacts, if we can't address the unsustainability of our institutions, if we can't um, have the capacity to face the world that is a VUCA world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, then we're, we have no chance. And even if we did it, we might have no chance. <laughs> but if we don't even see the problem or the enormity of the problem, then um, we're going to keep spiraling into, not irrelevance is like the least of our problems, but potentially spiraling into um, the end of the human species. <laughs> Okay, sorry, that was not what you asked. Right down to, to the extreme, right? The end of the world. <laughs> um, so then why, so then why, why internationalization? <laughs> well, I think it's partly because it is such a huge movement in our institutions. We have absolutely have to pay attention to um, what is behind it, what the impacts are and what possibilities there are for intervention. Um, so, you know, for instance, we have seen, I don't know how it is in the other parts of the world, but in uh, North America, in, in Canada and the US, in the post-World War II era, the, high, the internationalization was relatively small and very much focused on this aid-based model, which some people now romanticize that we're in a trade-based model, but of course the aid-based model was very much rooted in colonial assumptions and this idea of the Western benevolence and the universalism of our knowledge. So I'm not romanticizing that, but we now have this entirely economized internationalization. And I have to say, thinking about what, what our critique does, as far as I can tell, not terribly much. What it has done is made institutions rethink their PR strategies for sure. <laughs> and how they frame things in their strategic plan because they understand at this point that mm, there are some critiques about the coloniality of this. There's definitely some critiques about the idea of treating international students as cash cows. That doesn't mean they've stopped doing any of that. It's just that they talk about it differently. So you can also see how the critique gets sucked up by the institution, put into their PR machine, and then it looks like they're doing something different. And you can use that a little bit strategically and say, well, you said in your plan you were going to be more ethical. This isn't ethical, blah, 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 blah. But overall, I'm not sure how much critique itself can do. That doesn't mean it's not important. It's very important for us to see um, where things are coming from, where they're going, um, how it all fits together. But I think ultimately when I see what's actually changing conversations, internationalization, it's something like the pandemic where the external pressures, not the internal pressures from you know critical faculty, but the external pressures of um, this realization that they don't really care so much about the fact that the current mode of internationalization is unethical, but they can start to see that mm, maybe it's not sustainable. And then they start to pay attention. And that's another place where the critiques can be brought in again. And I think the critiques do contribute to this wider sort of contextual pressure, but in terms of having a direct impact, it doesn't probably have the impact that we want. And I think that's a fine if, if we can accept that and disinvest from the idea that our critique is going to do what we want it to do, what we think it should do. It's probably going to do a little something. <laughs> but if we can have a little more humility about that and then ask beyond critique, what else is needed? So for a lot of people beyond critique, what else is needed is organizing. And that is great. That work needs to be done. Um, in my case, what I focus on a lot is the pedagogical question, like what kinds of tools and resources can we produce for people working in institutions that they can make sense of the situation they find themselves in and to the, to the extent that it's possible, try and shift the conversation in probably very small ways. But if you add them up, it's, it's something and it can move things and also just help people who are in these institutions who are seeing a problem but don't quite know how to articulate it or how to navigate the gap between sort of their own critique and what they're asked to do as part of their role. If we can allow people a little more internal space and flexibility to say it's okay to sit with that contradiction, this whole thing is a contradiction. That doesn't mean just do whatever we want based on what's convenient, but it does mean this like some kind of desire for purity or adhering always to this vision that we want. 
it's, we kind of know it's impossible. So if we can disinvest from that and say, well, what actually is possible in our context based on both the wider analysis of what's happening and based on our position in the context and based on what can land in that space right now? That's great. I mean, some of the ways in which I guess I try to speak about it with people is a sense of almost coming to consciousness and scholarship helps you to do that, right? We read widely, you critique yourself, you engage um, with those within your context as well who are negotiating things. So there is a value there right down to you beginning to understand what is within your sphere of influence, how much agency do you have? Um, but still to know the larger picture. So you're still aware of, well, mm -hmm. you can do certain things. That doesn't necessarily mean now you, you know, you can blow your trumpet and that you've achieved all these great things because there's a larger mm -hmm. system at play, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you were speaking now, you spoke a little bit about um, how sustainability might be a sort of crack in the, in, in, well, I mean, this is where I'm putting it now, I guess, a crack in the armor where you might be able to then say, OK, I, I'm wanting to critique. And this is something that is a fertile ground, really, where I may be heard in a slightly better way. Um, are there other sort of cognate or, or fertile discourses that you have found in your scholarship that you've been able to either bring into proximity with internationalization to shift it to the more critical that you that you might want to share with us now. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, and it is just interesting just to backtrack a little bit that like when I said sustainability about it being a crack in the armor, I'm thinking of it not in terms of like ecological sustainability, which no one in the institution seems to care that much about, and more in terms of the sustainability of the system itself. But um, but in terms of what has allowed me to ask these questions about internationalization, I mean, various decolonial, postcolonial, anti-colonial critiques have been my sort of ground of, of analysis. But I, I also really see the importance of um, critical scholars of internationalization coming from their different theoretical perspectives and seeing what each of them brings. And I um, very much in mind, the Critical Internationalization Studies Network, it's very much a broad umbrella of anyone asking these questions in a critical way and actually trying to emphasize that, yes, we need to come together and we also need to understand that we are coming from very different places, not only theoretically, but also politically, geographically, racially, whatever else. And we, it doesn't serve us to flatten that. So that's also another thing I think about is just like there are strategic and intellectual and other reasons to come together across and do sort of what we might call or Adrian Marie Brown calls um, mile wide inch deep work, which is we, we're reaching a, a large number of people. And with something like the network, I think people doing this work in our institutions need that broad base of support because it's like, OK, we're not alone. We might be alone in our institution, but there's other folks out there trying to do this work. However, I also think it's really important that we have space for the inch wide mile deep work, which is going very deep in the rabbit hole of the particular questions that you're interested in. And it's not possible to do that with a, people coming from all these different perspectives, because then you can't go deep. You're always worried about making the connections at this superficial level. So I think it's important to have um, both kinds of work. And so part of my work is trying to bridge the conversations across the different approaches to internationalization. And part of it is this question about what does decolonial critique bring to internationalization studies? And I think at a superficial level, we get this analysis of, it's not superficial, but it's sort of the basic level of, you know, <clears throat> Western dominance continues, the very much economized version, uh, the racism that international students, international faculty face, the failure of curriculum internationalization, but I think a lot of my work is really interested in the, the complexities of those critiques. So for instance, what does it actually even mean to internationalize a curriculum? And if we're so deeply westernized in the canon and our approach to higher education, beyond sprinkling in a few authors from here and there, what would it actually mean to have an international curriculum? And I think if we're being honest, we don't really have any idea. Well, we have ideas, people have ideas, but for the most part, it's sort of this tokenistic inclusion. The other piece would be that a lot of people 
want these simplistic narratives in their critical approaches to internationalization. They want a clear victim and a clear villain and then maybe a victor of who's going to win. And there is there is a need for some of that. For instance, there is a need to say the institution is economically exploiting students by charging them the highest possible fees. However, if there, there's also this question, and I think I'm, think I'm thinking of the Canadian or the US context, which is international students coming often in some cases seeking social mobility within the very colonial US or Canadian system. And then sort of like, so you're systemically marginalized in terms of the economic uh, fees that you're paying, in terms of the racialization that you face at the university. And you might be systemically uh, dominant either in your home country and or here where you're potentially seeking a position within this very colonial society. So how do we create a space where we can have that conversation? It's extremely difficult. We can barely make the, the critique about the racism that international students are facing. And it can be weaponized if we start complexifying it too much in, in um, sort of basic conversations because people don't have the capacity to hold that. If they're looking for, okay, but who's the good guy, who's the bad guy? We're not gonna be able to have any kind of deep, complex, meaningful conversation. And yet, unfortunately, where we're at at the institutional level and in some cases in our scholarship is still sort of this broad brush strokes that are important and also don't go deep enough into facing um, the larger conditions that make internationalization possible and not just in terms of benefiting you know the host institution and host country but other people circulating within within this practice so it's not um, a simple story there's no simple solution and I, and that's for whatever reason, uh, not something we are you know, trained or educated to hold. We, we want simple answers that are going to make us feel good and feel like we're making progress and that we know what we're doing. And in a VUCA world, it's not possible. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, and I actually think certainly my experience of trying to do higher education studies is it's, it's not possible partly because we're part of the institution that we're looking at as well you know so those simplistic responses we we know even before we begin that it's mm -hmm. going to be a whole lot more complex but yet we're still wrapped up in that idea to some extent um sharon i know we've been talking for about half an hour but i feel like i feel like we haven't heard about um your particular work um <laughs> you are quite welcome right now to choose something that you would like to share about, um, perhaps a project or a particular research question or trajectory that you feel you're still very invigorated by, you still haven't properly answered, or you feel is still so pertinent and worrisome, um, mm -hmm. just to talk through it a little bit with us and share with us so, so that we have some sort of anchor in which to, to hold this in. And whoever's listening may also just realize um, some of the depth of what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. I'd really appreciate if, if you don't mind taking some time to do that. Yeah, um, I'm always struggling with this question of what exactly is my work? Like you can use the basics, like it's about internationalization, it's about decolonization. Yeah, sure, but like what about it? Um, but I will maybe start by saying that a lot of, uh, this is work that I find it's very hard to do alone. Uh, although the institution asks us to be these sort of um, individualistic scholars and uh, presumes that we are um, not dependent on other people or thinking through things with other people, I couldn't do this work without doing it with others. And a lot of the work that I do um, is with my research collective gesturing towards decolonial futures. And this is a um, transnational intergenerational collective of not just academics, but also other educators, students, um, activists, indigenous knowledge holders. And um, what we, we're basically asking questions at this interface of um, the question of colonial violence and the question of sustainability. And the question then is what kind of education can help us face the end of the world as we know it? So, <laughs> um, and that's not the end of the world necessarily, but the end of the, the modern colonial system that we have inherited and that is is clearly starting, according to our analysis, to crumble. So I think one way into that is that we say, like, often education is thought of as an informational task, that 
not just, you know, this banking education critique, but the idea that, you know, what we need to do is transmit particular ideas, particular frameworks, particular um, practices and skills, and that's education. And if we, in the question of colonialism and sustainability, particularly people say, okay, that's a problem of ignorance. We need to input more facts, more information so that they know, know the colonial history, so that they know just how bad the greenhouse gas situation has become. And we say, sure, those things are important. Like you need to have the basics. However, we say primarily what, we, what our analysis is that it's not a problem of information, but a problem of denial because we are still extremely invested in the promises that the modern colonial system gives us. And I would say that includes both the people like myself, who that system has benefited, but also many people who it hasn't, but to whom it has become a shiny dream. And perhaps the only imaginable dream for some people beyond the situation that they're in, which is also undesirable. So <laughs> The, the, the desire for continuity and the promises of that system leads us to deny four things. One is the denial of systemic colonial violence, the fact that any privileges or promises that are given within the modern colonial system are coming at someone's expense, and that's both people as well as the planet itself. The second one is the unsustainability of the system, in particular the economic, un or sorry, the ecological unsustainability. We have a system that says, Politically, economically, we need infinite growth, but we have a finite planet. So the math just doesn't add up. And yet, even in the sustainable development mode, it's the same basic narrative. The third denial is the denial of the fact that whether we like it or not, we're not independent individuals. We are actually deeply interdependent. And um, we have, therefore, responsibilities to each other that we mostly deny because we want to think of ourselves as only having responsibilities that we choose and only being in relation with people that we want rather than saying, well, it's a very interconnected planet, number one. And first and foremost, we're all sharing this planet. So the interdependence or the entanglement there is something that if we took really seriously, we might start feeling these responsibilities and we don't want to feel that. We don't want to feel the pain of others. So we say we are these independent, separate beings and we deny the entanglement. The fourth piece is a denial of the magnitude of the problem. It's like, I can't handle that, especially how complex it is. So I'm going to make a simplified version of the my analysis, and then I'm going to propose a simple solution, and it's not going to address it at all. Well, it might do something, some harm reduction, but it doesn't get at the root of the problem. So we say there are these four basic denials, and each of them has sort of depth in them, and I can share an image that tries to tease that out of it. But if the problem is denial, rather than a lack of information, it's a very different educational or pedagogical question of how do we address this? How do we interrupt people's denial and cause them to, to sense into, for instance, their entanglement with everything? And so that's where I see like scholarship in that realm, the intellectual realm, again, extremely important and can do something um, and it can be an invitation in, but at the end of the day, if we don't do the affective work of dealing with, um, you know, the, the sort of decluttered part of us that is super saturated with all of these desires and projections and fragilities and everything else, we're not going to be able to do the work that is needed. And if we don't do the relational work of learning how to build relationships based on trust, respect, re reciprocity, consent, and accountability, as opposed to this instrumental extractive kind of relationship that we've been fostered to do, we're also not going to be able to face the end of the world as we know it. So I think, you know, I when I think about the intellectual piece, which is my work in many ways, I know it's only like 5% of what needs to be done. And that 5% is needed. So it's, it's okay. But I know I'm not thinking that it's doing everything. I'm understanding that we need the people who are really good at you know, clearing our affective clutter. We need the people who are modeling for us how to have different kinds of relationships. And that's why doing this work in the collective has been so important for me is because we need all of these different medicines together to even have the chance of figuring out one possible, you know, way of going about um, these overwhelming shit show that we're facing. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really so good that you that you speak about that, because I think, um, I mean, who knows who's listening, but I certainly <laughs> know that 
I certainly know that there are many who will feel that they're wanting, they can see something and they're wanting to do a huge thing or they're invested in in um, something changing or have experienced something of such great, large magnitude, right? And they may also feel quite alienated um, or alone in their desire to do something or desire to study something or, mm-hmm. and that, I mean, if, you know, this, I'm hoping to embed this within a module and certainly within a class, we can discuss and debate and see and try to find ways of to connect. Um, but one of the, I mean, one of the other benefits of being part of universities, even as fraught as they are, is that we can have these connections um, through our university spaces and can sometimes create those spaces for those who are outside of the university, but who are wanting to have these discussions and don't find that there. You know, it's one of the ways we can use it. Um, all right. Um, so I guess the last question I wanted to ask is, um, I mean, so I've got here noted additional other areas are abolitionist studies, critical university studies that you and I have um, had some relations around and are trying to inf- like inform a, a sort of fledgling mm-hmm. network of art. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you see the relations between between those um, or, and, and, and the work that you're doing within this collector? Because obviously it's slightly separate or mm-hmm. is it another thing, you know? Um, <laughs> well, just some reflections on that. Yeah, I mean, I um, started in higher ed studies. I did my master's in the higher ed studies program, and um, I was like missing some things. And so when I looked to do my PhD, I, I looked for a program that would allow me to really question the field of higher education studies, not like not for the sake of questioning, but like for seeing what else is out there, because I think we say it's an interdisciplinary field but we're still pretty much reliant on a few disciplines and things like sociology, some in terms of in student affairs work, like psychological theories that are, I, I think in the field of psychology, somewhat maybe even outdated, but we are still drawing on them. And I think there is really a strong investment within the field of higher ed studies in the institution and its continuity because Partly, I think, because it's such a practice-oriented field, and so many people in the field um, go back and forth between administration and scholarship. And I think that brings a lot of strengths to the field because we're not totally working in this abstract mode. However, I think having some distance from the institution is very difficult. Um, we're very intimate with our object of study and, in many cases, very invested in it. And that's not to say it doesn't happen in critical university studies. I think it does perhaps less so abolitionist university studies. Um, but I, I was looking for, for what else was out there and then became sort of theoretically promiscuous of like, I'm just going to use what's useful. And I'm not going to, I know it's an uphill battle in terms of changing the field. And what's the point of changing the field for the sake of changing the field if I can have the conversation without it? It's like, meh. Um, that changing a bit because I think going back to the generational thing, there are young people in the field and more diverse people in the field who are pushing for conversations about colonialism and other things. Um, so I think there there are some threads that are moving across these different um, abolitionist university studies, critical university studies and higher ed studies. Um, but I do think they, they do come with their own orienting assumptions and desires. And I'm think, thinking again of how it works in the North American context, um, where higher ed studies is a very established field, very practice oriented, then critical university studies is quite small, um, made up of mostly humanities scholars who are um, kind of pointing out the problems of the institution um, and often looking for sort of more of a social democratic solution. And I, and I think, some, in some cases, looking back to the, the post-war university and saying, not that we want the same thing, but that there's a lot there that we would like to sort of go back to, which I say, number one, I don't think that's going to happen, um, sort of logistically speaking, because, <laughs> for instance, capitalism is very different than it was um, then, and therefore I don't think it benefits capitalism in the same way that it did to, to, to fund and have the state fund higher education in the same way. 
But also we know that, you know, those institutions may, were still extremely colonial and racialized and hadn't dealt with their legacies of colonialism and racism either. So then we have abolitionist university studies. Um, and I think they're, they're trying to ask very different questions, not assuming the continuity of um, the university as we know it and really trying to address the roots of, of the colonial institution and how that continues to shape today. I know that there's a lot of movement right now in the US and Canada about um, cops off campus as the, the kind of push from abolitionist university studies right now. I think whether people in that group are actually wanting to abolish the institution, some are, some aren't. A lot of us are getting our paychecks from the institution though. so. <laughs> There's that. Um, but you know, my approach has been to draw on what is useful, but also understand that um, there's there's things that these fields can bring to each other, but they need a translation. Um, I think if I just bring you know the critique of abolitionist university studies to a mainstream higher ed studies conference, they might get something out of it, but it's not going to be deep because it's going to be here's the things that I can latch on to and I'll take what's useful and take and not consider what's not. When in reality, the most important things are the things that take a little bit of grappling with. So some of the things I've tried to do is say, OK, what is it that this group of people is trying to ask about that we're not asking that could be useful? Not because we have nothing to offer and they have everything, but there might be something to be had in that in that interface. And so in that case, you're always going to betray both sides. And so you're, you're probably going to make both sides unhappy. <laughs> and uh, that's fine. Um, but I, I, I think I want us to to ask basically deeper questions. And I think disinvesting from the institution has been something I'm, I'm grappling with. And that doesn't mean that you have to leave the institution, um, because as long as we have them, we should be reducing harm within them. We should be trying to see how we can redistribute resources from the institution to communities who are actually doing different kinds of work. Um, and there might be, there are a lot of people here. So like there's a space to intervene with students and with also faculty and, uh, and staff people. So there's something to be done here. But when I think about my investments, it's not in the continuity of the institution itself. It's for investing in the possibility of a different kind of higher education that may or may not have much to do with the one we currently have. But I'm I'm figuring out how we can use this space to ask that question. And I, I'm not too worried about the fact, I mean, I am and I'm not, that that's a huge contradiction that the I talk all day about the coloniality of the institution and yet it's paying my bills. I mean, that, that's a reality we have to be real with. And I think going back to internationalization, I think something that just as an example of how we can sit with that contradiction is like, I know a lot of people, including people who aren't even internationalization scholars, are really critical of, for instance, international student fees and how high they are. But I also know that our, given the finances of our institution, our jobs are dependent on that. And I, and I wish we could just be a little more real about, OK, yes, I have this critique. And I'm a little frustrated it's not landing. But then if, what if it did land? And what if some of us lost our jobs? Like those are the kinds of things we don't the, the we don't follow that trail too much because it gets too messy and where our complicity becomes too clear. One is whereas I say, let's put it all on the table and work from there. Let's start with being honest and then and hyper self-reflexive and then decide what we want to do and be real about the compromises that we're making. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do think that that helps hugely with get past the sort of culture of complaint, which is what we call it in South Africa. Mm. Which is, I mean, that complaint is quite necessary to get a gauge around what's bothering people, what sits badly mm -hmm. with people, what bugs them in terms of their social and academic practices. But then, you know, the, the level of honesty around what one would be prepared to compromise is often very is a very difficult conversation because it also requires us to acknowledge some of our our self-interest that we, we may mm -hmm. not um, consciously invest in mm -hmm. but, but definitely benefit from you know mm -hmm. uh, all right. I mean, I think I've really thank you so much. You've you've touched on some really beautiful stuff. 
I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Is there anything else that you would like to end with um, before before we sign off this recording? I guess I'll say like number one, a sort sort of apology, but not, which is like I'm not sure. <laughs> This might feel like it had nothing to do with internationalization in some ways. So apologies, listener. However, I think it does. And I don't know how well I've been able to, to articulate that. Um, I think, like, I will share some articles that, that try to do that in a more linear way than I probably did today. Um, but I think we are allowed to ask very different kinds of questions than the ones we have been socialized to ask, because I'm not sure that all the questions we're asking are still relevant in this time. So what we tend to do, and this is an insight from David Scott, is like we keep asking the same questions and what we change is our answers. But in reality, sometimes the context shifts so much that we also need different questions. So I would invite you to think about like what questions are currently orienting your field or your context and are those the most pressing questions that need to be asked? And if not, why? And if, if you can think of what the other ones are, it may not be possible to just dump them into your context. You would have to ask, what would be the ducks that I need to line up in order to get us to the questions that might actually matter? Which doesn't even mean you have to throw away the old questions. It's just there might be other ones that we're missing. And so I, I would encourage people to, on the, on the one hand, not feel boxed in by the sort of norms and, and at the center of their field, but also being aware that if you go too far, um, you might become illegible. So you might have to do some translation work between, and this is what I've been doing for my whole career so far, is trying to bridge some gaps and translate some things with some successes and some failures because some things just don't land and then you have to try something else or you have to articulate it in a different way. And um, yeah, I think 